so good to be with uh, God's people this morning to bring God's word. And if you have that Bible, if you go ahead and turn to John chapter 17, John, the gospel of John in the New Testament. If you've been paying attention, we've said that in John 13 through 16, those chapters, it's actually Jesus' last moments with his 11 closest friends, with his disciples. And uh, I like to call it his farewell discourse because he's about to leave this earth by way of the cross. And he's going to be crucified, raised again on the third day, and then ascend to the Father 40 days later. And so he's got these, these special intimate moments that he's able to share with his disciples who he's going to leave behind. They're going to be they're going to freak out. They're going to wonder, what, why are you going, Jesus? You know, uh, we can't live without you. And he's telling them, no, actually, it's going to be for your good because the Spirit's going to come. And, and trust me, trust me, trust me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. To trust me. And so he, he goes through all of that, and it ends at, end, at the end of chapter 16. And in, in chapter 17, he goes into a complete separate mindset where he begins to pray. Now, after chapter 17, we read, and he's, he ends up in the Garden of Gethsemane, and you know how he prays there for God's will to be done. And eventually, a few hours later, he's crucified. He dies in your place and my place. He takes the hell that you and I deserve on the cross, right? He dies for our sins. And, uh, and so that's all going to happen. But before that happened, he, he prays. And what I think is awesome is that the Holy Spirit chose to keep this chapter in the Bible that he actually gives us the privilege of eavesdropping on Jesus' prayer. Have you ever heard anybody praying like when they didn't know you were listening? Like some of you had some praying moms or grandmas or praying dads or whatever, and maybe you were walking by and, and you heard their voice and you stopped and you're like, let me see what they're praying. See if they mention me at all, you know. And you eavesdrop. Because I've heard other people praying in it, and what it does to me is it encourages me, and it, and it speaks something about their relationship with God, right? And this is what Jesus does. He lets us in on his relationship with his heavenly Father, and he begins to pray and shows this incredible glimpse of, of what he is doing even now for us. Because the Bible says that right now he's still praying for you. He's interceding for you as our high priest, right? And so we kind of get a glimpse of his intercessory ministry, his intercessory prayer as he does even now. So I'm going to read God's word, but I'd like you to honor that word today by standing if you're able to. Uh, John 17, there's 11 verses we're going to read, and so we're going to go ahead and just stand. And I want to say this is considered the greatest prayer ever recorded in all of history. It's the Son of God speaking to the Father. It's one of the mountain peaks of Scripture. And as we begin to read it, I, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just kind of impact you with it, even the parts that I'm not going to expound on. But reality is that we can do an entire series of messages just based on this amazing prayer that Jesus offers up to his Father, and he allows us to listen in today. John 17, verse 1. After Jesus said this, all the discourse that he gave with his disciples, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world 
but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Father, thank you for the privilege of this powerful living word that you have preserved for us for such a time as this. It is not an accident that we have joined in this moment, heard, and apply this word. You have ordained it, Father, because you want to say and you want to do and you want to change something in all of us. And I pray that as a result of the moments that we spend together on this beautiful Sunday morning, as your people in your presence, that by this word you will change the way we see things, change our perspectives, God, change, God, the way we think so that our lives can be transformed. And we'll be quick to give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. For you deserve it all. And we pray these things in the name of the strong Son of God. In the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but if you've ever been with someone towards the end of their lives, one of the things that you recognize is that you pay attention to what they're saying because typically the words of someone when they get to the end of their life reveals a lot about that person's priorities. It says a lot about what really mattered to them in, the, in life and what matters to them even at the end of their lives. And we know from Scripture that Jesus, after his resurrection, would spend another 40 days with his multiple disciples. But the thing is that God decided not to record a lot of the words that he spoke with them after his resurrection. We get glimpses of what he said to them and what he did with them, but we don't have a, a record of his words like we do here in John 17, where we know these are the last words of Jesus as he speaks to his closest friends. And he's saying, listen, this is important. Listen to me. And when you listen and you study the words of Christ throughout all of this portion of scripture, including his prayer, you can't help but walk away recognizing and understanding that all of these words speak volumes of what he considered his priorities in life. Of what he knew, what, what, he, what really mattered to him. Of course, we know if you've been here the last four weeks that not only did he reveal his priorities, but one of his priorities is a priority in your life. And that is that his top priority is that you and our top priority would be that we would continue to abide in Christ, stay connected to his life, draw from his life in relationship with Jesus so that we can actually live and stop existing. And so we know that's a priority in our lives. So everything that we talk about today, understand this, it all flows from the number one priority all of us should have, and that is to abide in Christ Jesus through his word, through his people, through his presence, through worship, through all of the things that he has allowed us to participate in. And here's the question that we have to ask ourselves, because as we prioritize abiding in him, then what will happen is that other priorities will begin to rise to the surface. If we don't put him first, nothing will work. But when we put him first, then everything else falls in line the way it should be. Priorities. And the question that we ought to all the time, because it's so easy to divert from it, the question we need to ask ourselves all the time is, what are my priorities? What really matters to me in life? Because here's the thing, guys, when we reach the end of our days on earth, and I know some of you think you're going to live forever, but you ain't. If Jesus doesn't come back, 
all of us are going to get to the point. These bodies of ours are daily dying, becoming more like the dust from which they were created. And if Jesus doesn't come back, every one of us will draw our last breath on this earth. And in the midst of all that, we need to ask ourselves, did I live my life by those priorities? Because here's the deal, guys. All of us have priorities. All of us do. The question is not whether we have priorities. The question is, are they the right priorities? Are they the kind of priorities like Jesus had, right? See, I believe that a big part of living the abundant life, Jesus died to give us abundant life. Jesus died and wants us to live that abundant life. That's part of abiding in him, right? It's this, this life that is that's full of joy and peace and all the, the glory of God. Uh, he wants us to live that kind of life. But part of knowing and living that abundant life is the ability to know and to separate the important from the unimportant. Because all of us have important stuff and unimportant stuff. And the question is, which one is which? I see a lot of people putting a whole lot of priorities into things that really don't really matter, that one day is all going to pass away. So what are our priorities? And here's how you can determine what's important and what's not important, is to be able to acknowledge and know and to separate the temporal from the eternal. Because here's the deal. Our bodies may die, but we will continue to live somewhere. And the Bible only gives us two options. Either we are going to live forever and ever in the presence of Jesus. Or we're going to live forever, forever and ever separated from the presence of Jesus. One is called heaven. To be in the presence of Christ is heaven. One is called hell. To be separated from the presence of God is hell. And the only thing that determines that is what we live our lives today. If we know the eternal is important, then we will abide in Jesus and continue to abide in him. But if we emphasize everything that is unimportant, that is temporal, that one day will pass away with everything else in this world, then friends, we will find ourselves at the end of our lives or standing before the judge of all creation and recognize, whoa, I prioritized the wrong things. Friends, the eternal always trumps the temporal always one thing lasts forever the other thing doesn't last at all and in verse number four that we read jesus prayed and he reveals the most eternal significance an eternal significance something that we recognize must be the priority of our lives he says this father i have glorified you on the earth I have glorified you. So Jesus looks at his 30 plus years on this earth, living his life out for your sake and mine as a real man, living by the power of God alone. And he's living. And he looks back at his 30 plus years. He says, Father, as I get to the end of this time on on earth, I recognize that I have glorified you. We're glorifying the original language is doxatso. Doxatso. And what it means is this, it means to radiate, to shine forth, to make known, to manifest, to reflect. And it carries the idea of, living, of leaving a valid and accurate impression, a favorable impression of something. You read the Old Testament, you see that every so often God would reveal himself to his people. And he would do so in what the Old Testament calls his Shekinah or his glory. And you read the Old Testament, there were moments when God all of a sudden would put, pull back the veils of temporary stuff and he would reveal the eternal and his glory would fill a place, his glory would fill the area. And friends, nobody could be in that glory without recognizing the presence of God. And whenever he left and, and went back to where he came from and, and left that, it left a favorable and accurate impression of who he was. Nobody can walk away from the glory of God and not have an understanding of who God is. So when Jesus declares, Father, Father, I have glorified you. I have glorified you. What he is saying is, Father, I have revealed who you are. 
My 30 plus years on this earth, I, I have perfectly radiated and reflected the true essence of who you are. I have manifested who you are to those around me. That no matter where I was, I was leaving a favorable impression. I'm about to leave this earth, but God, thank you. I have glorified you. I have left an accurate impression of you. And the writer of Hebrews captures this so perfectly. He says, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory. What's he the radiance of? God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Father, I have left, I have left an accurate impression of you on earth. Wouldn't it be great if we were at the end of our lives and we know that we're about to meet the Creator and we could actually lift up our eyes to the Lord and say, Father, because of you, because of your grace in my life, I have left a favorable impression, an accurate impression of who you are. Father, my kids know who you are. Because I glorified you on this earth. I left them an accurate and favorable impression of who you are. My co-workers, God, they saw me every day. And, and God, I glorified you. I left them a favorable and accurate impression of who you are. My family saw and they knew that I followed you, Father. They knew that by your grace I was one of your sons, one of your daughters. And now that I'm at the end of my life, I can look back and they can know who you are because I left them a favorable and accurate impression of who you are. Friends, that was the priority of Jesus. And it needs to be our priority as well. See, the one who created us and gives us the breath that we breathe created us for the very purpose of living our lives out for his glory. And you say, well, Jesus is God. And of course he left that favorable impression. Yes. And we will never live our lives, especially when he glorified him in the cross. Not, none of us is called to that. We will never live the perfect life that Jesus, he lived it in our behalf. But here's the reality, friends. God calls us to become like Jesus. And so the question that has to be asked, well, how did Jesus glorify the Father? Give me some examples of how he glorified the Father. What is it that he did that by the same power that he did it, because he never tapped into his divinity while on this earth, he always tapped into the same power that you and I have available to us. And that's the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So how did he, what did he do? What are some examples of him living out that left such a favorable impression that glorified the Father? And I'm so glad you asked me that this morning because I have the rest of my message to answer that for you. Because I believe that as we study his words, he gives us insight in how he did that. See, when, when we see how Jesus glorified the Father, here's what's going to happen. It will help you and me, it will help us to be able to prioritize the important over the unimportant. Christ's life helps us understand what is truly important in life, what really matters in life. And as a result of us understanding that and putting into practice, guess what happens? We glorify God. We leave a favorable impression of who he is. So for starters, let's look at back at verse number four. He said, I have glorified you on the earth. Father, I have glorified you on the earth. How? Come on, read that last part with me. By completing the work you gave me to do. I glorified you by completing, by finishing the work you gave me to do. Let me give you a word that, for, that really matters in your life and mine. That is the beginning of us being able to understand how to glorify him. And that word is commitment. Can you say that with me? Commitment. Now that is a word that is still used in this life, in this world that we live in today, but it's not practiced. Because what we see today is a lack of commitment in people's lives. They'll tell you they're going to do something and then they don't do it. 
They'll tell you they're going to finish the job, and then halfway through, they quit. They tell you they're going to love you forever and ever, no matter what you do, in, in, whether it's riches or poor, in sickness or in health. And then when the first time bad stuff happens, see you later. Got somebody else I'm going to try it with. So commitment is something that we hear, but it's not seen very much. But here's the bottom line, friends. If I'm going to glorify the Father on the earth, I've got to be a man that is committed to God's will for my life. And that commitment, which is so different than what the world does, will itself begin to reveal the God who is 100% committed towards you. See, you and I must be committed persons. Turn to somebody and say, you need to be committed. No, then some of you are like, yeah, you're crazy, dude. I'm going to commit you. I'm not talking about that kind of commitment. Not com have yourself committed. <laughs> it took a little while for some of you to get it. It's like, oh, yeah. Okay, I got it. But the bottom line is that we need to be people of commitment. When we say we're going to be there, when we say we're going to get there a certain time, Whatever we say, we're committed to it, no matter what happens. No matter what the cost is, no matter what the price is, the moment I commit myself to something, I'm sticking with it. Now, specifically, Jesus here says he was committed to completing the work that, Jesus, that God the Father had given him. He said, I have done my assignment, Father. I have completed the work you gave me. I have finished the work you gave me. So how do I glorify God? What really matters Here's what really matters. What really matters is that I commit to completing the assignment God has given me. Can you say that with me? What really matters is that I commit to completing the assignment God has given me. See, Jesus had completed his ministry on earth. He had done his miracles, the messages that all pointed to the Father. And then he trained his disciples. He knew he was about to leave them. So he imparted three and a half years of his life into them. He completed that. He's about to leave them behind, right? So now Jesus is on his way to Calvary. What's going to happen on Calvary? He's going to fulfill his ultimate assignment, and that is to die for your sins and mine, to die in your place and my place. Now, that's just, that's just a, a day or two away still from happening, and yet he's praying here to the Father, and he says, I've done it. I've completed the work you gave me. So how can Jesus say that he's completed the work that God has given him when he has yet to die on the cross. It's going to be a day or so before he says it is finished. You know why? Because Jesus was so committed to finishing in a, that assignment that God had given him. That in his mind, in his heart, in his spirit, in his soul, it was as good as done. He knew there was nothing that was going to stop him, divert him, distract him, or keep him from finishing the work that God had given him. So in advance of it even happening, he's already saying, I've done it. Father, I've completed the work that you gave me to do. How can he say something? Because, how can he say that? Because of his, what? Yeah, it's, the, it's that word I gave you earlier that was like big commitment. Remember that one? Everybody say commitment. Okay. Some of you said Jesus because, you know, you grew up in kids' church. And every, every, quest, every answer is Jesus. It's commitment. He was so committed to doing the will of God, it was as good as done, right? Being committed to God's will, completing God's assignment for his life is what really mattered to him. In John 9, he says this, listen, as long as it is day, we must what? Do the, the work of him who sent me. I got to do the Father's work. As long as I'm able to, as long as it's day, as long as there's nothing stopping me like the cross, which is going to finish my work, but until then, I'm going to do the work God has told me and given me to do. In John 14, he says, the world must learn that I love the Father. How, do, how are they going to know that he loves the Father? Because I what? I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Not partially. Not, hey, I'll take this part of the work you've given me, Jesus, but I'm going to add this little part here. I'm going to take this part out. No, exactly what my Father has commanded me. And for just like Jesus, if we're going to glorify God, if we're going to leave a favorable impression to those that matter most to us in this world, if we're going to leave a favorable impression to the, with the people that we have contact with on a daily basis or through, throughout our lives, 
then we need to complete the work. We need to complete the assignment that God has given us. That ought to be one of the things that really matters is to complete his assignment. But the reality is this. That there are some of us in this room even now and watching online that are guilty of not doing what we were assigned to do. When I was growing up in school, whether there was elementary, whether it was junior high, whether it was high school, and even when I went through my master's, I didn't like it, but I still did it. But here's two things that I hated. I hated homework. Can I get a witness? And there was absolutely no way you were going to get me to stand in front of people and talk. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? So really. So here's the thing. What I would do is I would focus all of my attention on the exams, on the tests. And if I ace those tests, I have to do homework. If I, if I ace those tests, I can take a zero on the oral report, you know. But there was one class, it was a history class, can't even remember what grade it was, and I wasn't doing that well on my tests. So I was forced to have to do the homework if I was going to pass that test. And so I remember getting that test, it was a history, it was a chapter in a the, in the, in the history book, and, and the teacher wanted us to, to write a, a paper on that particular chapter, and so I, man, I took some time, I, I put all of my efforts into it, and, and, and I wrote that paper, and, and then I, I proudly handed it in, I'm thinking, man, I got this, I got this. Gave, him the, gave her the paper, and a couple days later, I get it back. And you know how teachers, just, they just love that red pen. I told first service that uh, in, in, our, in our staff, I'm the one that uses the red pen now. And I don't let anybody else use it. No, you can't be using red pen. That's mine. Come here. That's my, that's my authority. But she used the red pen. So on the top of the paper, she writes down, she says, good grammar, Nelson. It's like, yeah. Very, very well written. Very well written. Content was great. And then she put this big letter. I don't know if you ever saw one of these letters on your papers, but it was a big F. The circle around it. I'm like, good grammar, good content. What? The, what's going on? Well, a couple spaces later on, she said, wrong chapter. <laughs> wrong assignment. Friends, God has given us all an assignment. There's this overarching assignment that all of us as the followers of Jesus have. We all share this assignment. And that is that we would be the best and the greatest witnesses we can be to who he is. To leave a favorable impression through our works, through our deeds, through our, through our actions, through, our, through everything that we do, through our words. That's being a witness testifying to the grace and the goodness and the awesomeness of Jesus. But underneath that umbrella of that overarching assignment that all of us have, God in his wisdom, he has, he has gifted every one of us as individuals with his personalities and, and individual giftings and talents. And he says, according to those gifts and the talents and the personality that I've given you, within that I've given you another assignment as well. That's my assignment to you. And then overall, we have the assignment of being a, a man of God, of being a woman of God, the assignment of being a servant of God, because serving in the kingdom of God is not an option. It is what we do as the people of God. He's given us the assignment of being a faithful friend, not a fair weather friend, but a faithful friend, a godly mother, a godly father, a godly son, a godly daughter, a godly husband, a godly wife, a godly employee, a godly employer. Those are assignments that God has given us as his people. But some of you have become so distracted, so unfocused, that you're putting all of your energy, all of your time into things that God never assigned for you to do. And you may be really good at some of those things. Great content. Wonderful grammar. But God's going to grade you one day. And he's going to put a big fat F wrong assignment you're really good at it fortunately that was the wrong chapter that was not what you should have put all of your effort into 
Now, even as I say that, some of you are like, why did I come to church today? Because God loves you. And you're not here by accident. And God wants you to understand that he has given you an assignment. And he wants you to stop with the wrong assignment. And he wants to reinforce your right assignment. He wants you to begin to go. He wants to remind you of what your assignment is. He wants to empower you. He wants you to glorify him by completing not somebody else's assignment, but by completing your assignment. It's good news that he loves us so much that he doesn't just keep going. Teacher could have said, ah, just let it slide. No. She cared enough to say, no, I need to make sure he gets the right assignment. He wants you to leave here today, friends, knowing that God has assigned you, that he has given you an assignment. And he wants you to leave here today so determined, with such commitment, that you will not allow anything or anyone to come into your life that will distract you from that assignment, that will discourage you or divert you from the priority of the things that really matter in life, the things that really matter in life, the things that count that are eternal. So don't let even the demons of hell stop you from doing what God has called you to do. What counts is that you live the kind of life that brings honor and glory to God, that leaves a favorable, impressive, uh, accurate and favorable impression of who he is. What really matters is that you live the kind of life that is committed to the assignment of God, that you're not going to let anything or anyone stop you from breaking, uh, keep you from keeping your word. But instead, you're going to say, I made this commitment. And as Jesus showed us, he was committed to the end. I will be committed to the end. Did it cost Jesus? Yeah, it did. It cost him more than it will ever cost any of us. But he loved us so much, and he loved the Father so much, he said, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish it. Secondly, not only do you do it through your commitment, but you do it through your character. Everybody say character. Character. Now, I'm going to take a sip of this water, so while I'm doing that, will you please read John 17, 6 for me, please? Read it nice and loud. I need another sip. Can you read it again, please? Father, I have glorified you because my life has revealed your name. Now, when you read through Scripture, you recognize very quickly that the name of God always has something to do with who God is. It always has something to do with his attributes, his, his, the kind of character that he has, who he is, and what he does as a result of his nature, as a result of not just what he does, but who he is. So the name of someone always spoke of the character of someone. You read through the scriptures, you'll see that there are different people that were, their names were changed because they wanted their natures to change as well, their character to change as well. Well, God, from the very beginning, he doesn't have to change. He's not man that should change. He's perfect perfectly from, the, from all eternity. So he gave us a name that reveals who he is. It speaks of who he is. And what Jesus is saying here, that his life was a manifestation of who God is, of the character of God. See, what really matters is that I reveal God accurately to the world. All of us are revealing God, but are we revealing him accurately? Some of us need to stop revealing him the way we have been. And we're giving him a bad name instead of a good name. So say that with me. What really matters is that I reveal God accurately to the world. And in verse 11 of the same chapter, Jesus, as, a, as he addresses the Father, he calls him Holy Father. He describes his nature, the nature of God, the nature of the Father. He describes it as, as holy, as holy. See, because God is, is holy, then because he is holy, he is good. He is pure. He is unstained by sin. 
He's the standard of righteousness. If we want to know what righteousness looks like, we look at God because he is the standard of righteousness, right? He, he is just. He's loving. He's kind. He's merciful. And yet he's always right. He's just. He makes sure that he punishes the wicked and he rewards the righteous. That is God. And the reason he's that is because he is holy. He is perfect in every way. He's not just good. He is perfectly good. He doesn't just love you. He perfectly loves you. He doesn't just give you grace and mercy he perfectly gives you perfect grace and perfect mercy because he is holy now we hear that word and depending on what kind of church you grew in sometimes we hear holy and like ah i don't want that man i i ran from that because some people's definition of holy is a bunch of rules and regulations that you have to keep if you're going to be holy they don't even say holy they say holy Never hear him praying, it's like, no, holy God, no, holy God. And God has that extra syllable in it, God. But that's not the holiness of God. See, God is holy, and the very root of that means that he is set apart, that he is distinct from all of his creation, and that he is distinct and different from any and every so-called gods because there's only one god and it's him and so all these pagans had these gods and god said i'm holy when you compare me to all these fake gods these demons that they worship i'm nothing like them i am different i am distinct i am perfect see the amidst, in the midst of all the common stuff of the world he stood out as uncommon and what he is saying is, I don't want you to be common. Because the Bible teaches us in 1 Peter. Peter says this. He says, listen, you must live as God's what? Obedient children. Look what he says. Don't slip back into your old ways of living. Now listen, if you're still living that way, it's not your old ways, it's your present ways, right? But he's talking about people that actually have come out of that. That now they're followers of Jesus. They're no longer in the world. They're, now, they're not of the world. They're now followers of Christ. And he says, just, you remember how you used to be BC before Christ? He says, don't slip back into those old, old ways to satisfy whose desires? Your own. You didn't know any better then. What's he implying? You know better now. <laughs> now that you know Jesus, now that you know his word, now that you know his presence, now that you know his joy, now that you know his salvation, you know better now. But now, because you know better, you must be what? Holy in how much? In everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. What he's saying is you need to live such a life that you stand out. You're distinct. You don't speak like the common way that people speak. You don't live in the common way that people live. You don't act and gossip and attack. and You don't do any of those things that, that you used to do when you were common. I have set you apart. I have made you holy. You are now uncommon. Come on, turn to someone and say, we're uncommon. We're uncommon. See, if you and I are to be committed to our assignment, if, we need to re if we're going to reflect the Father accurately, then our lives must reveal this aspect of the nature of God. He is holy. He is different. If I talk like the rest of the world and I act like the rest of the world and I hate like the rest of the world and I live like the rest of the world, that's not holiness. That's the world. But for the people of God, we're different. We're holy. Hebrews 12, 14 says, work at living in peace with everyone and work. Everybody say work. work. At living a holy life. It does. Listen, you have to make the effort to be able to continue to abide in Christ and, and live in him and, and be with his people and do all that God has given us to do and be. And, and as that, he says, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. He says, in everything you do, 
Everything. You see, God's holy is fundamental to his nature. So if we're going to glorify him, if we're going to reveal him accurately and favorably, if we're going to manifest his name on this earth and therefore glorify him, Peter says you need to be holy in some of the things you do. I want to see who you were, who was listening. Some of y'all said amen, and you weren't listening. You're like, oh, he paused. Let me say amen. <laughs> no, in everything we do. In everything. That means that you and I, let me simplify for you. It means that you and I are progressively becoming more like the Holy One, Jesus. It doesn't have to be difficult. Listen, if I look at my life and I'm more like Jesus than I was before, I'm becoming holy. Right? It's a progressive thing. None of us is going to be perfect until we see him face to face. But in the meantime, we ought to get closer and closer to him and who he is. We ought to reveal him in a greater way. And when we mess up and don't reveal him accurately, we immediately confess it. We immediately repent of it. We immediately go and say, that wasn't Jesus. What I just, the way I just said that to you, that, that wasn't not Jesus. That was wrong of me. So don't look at your husband and say, you're not holy. Instead, look at him and say, you know what? You're holier today than you were last year. Right? Because we are progressively becoming like Jesus. We're progressively becoming what? Yes. And, like, and Jesus is holy. Holy. That's why he said, listen, listen. It's not, it's not possible for you to do this. It's not possible for you to become like me by yourself. You don't have the power to do it. You need me. And that's why in John 15, 5, we read it so many times. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And those who abide in me and I in them, what do they do? They bear much fruit. Part of that fruit is the character of God. Because apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Jesus said it. He said, listen, who, humanly speaking, it is impossible but with God, come on, let's say this together. With God, everything is possible. We can and will be holy. Because who lives in us? See, has, Jesus has come to us in his spirit, by his spirit, right? And it's not just the spirit who lives in us. If we're abiding in Christ, if we've given our life to Jesus, we don't just say the spirit lives in us. We say he is the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit lives in us and he is reproducing himself in us, then we are becoming more and more like him. And if he is the Holy Spirit, then we are becoming more and more holy. Holy. If you're abiding in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And that's why Paul is able to write to the Ephesian church. Look what he says. He says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. Common is darkness. Uncommon is light. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. He says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. That's what we should live our lives for. God, what does this please you? I'm about to go here. Does this please you? I'm about to do this. Does this please you? I'm about to say this. Does it please you? I'm about to post this. Does it, see, does it please you? I'm about to look at this. Does it please you? That's how we become like him. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them mainly by our lives. So be careful how you live. Come on, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. How many can say there are evil days that we're living in right now? He says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine. Some of you are like, I don't drink wine. Tequila, whiskey, scotch, you name it. It's all included. Because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. All the other junk is just fake stuff that's trying to take the place of the real one. That's the Spirit of God. So Paul writes to people who want to glorify God, and he says, you can do it. Just, just live like wise men and women. 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're going to walk according to his ways. So Jesus prayed. He says, Father, I have glorified you. I have left a favorable impression of you by finishing the work you gave me to do, by revealing your name, by, by showing people who I am, who you are. See, what really matters is that we glorify God by committing to completing our assignment. Amen? And that we live in a way that truly reveals, that really reveals, that accurately reveals the true character of God who we say lives in us. So we do it by our, what's the first word? Thank you. First, you better than first service. First service is like, uh, bah, 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 yeah. commitment. What's the next one? Character. And here's the third and last one, consecration. I put this last, but it should be first. Because this happens first, and then the rest will follow. Jesus said in John 17, 10 to the Father, Father, all I have is yours. And all you have is mine. And then in verse 11, he says, he says, Holy Father, keep them. Speaking of his disciples right there, they're listening in. They're hearing what he's saying. He says, keep them by the power of your name, of who you are. The name you gave me, the character, the, the same person that I am. That they may be one as we are one. So Jesus says, all I have, Father, all of it is yours. Everything, everything is yours. All that I am, everything I have, Father, it's yours. My gifts, they're yours. My talents, they're yours. My ministry, they're yours. My work, they're yours. I place everything in your hands because it all came from your hands in the first place. And then he prays for his disciples. The men that he had grown to love and had grown in the closest of relationships on this earth. And he says, Father, these men that you have given me, I put them back in your hands. You gave them to me. I'm giving them back to you. Why? Because I want you to keep them in your, in the, by the power of your name. Keep them by who you are. So I put them in your hands so that you can keep them. See, what really matters is consecration. It's dedication. Here's what really matters. What really matters is that I take everything God has blessed me with and I place it back into his hands. Come on, say that with me. What really matters is that I take everything God has blessed me with and place it all in his hands. And it starts by acknowledging that every good and perfect gift that you experience even now, every breath that you breathe is a gift from your good, good Father. And if I want to glorify Him with everything He has given me, I need to put it back into His hands. So Jesus put all that He did in God's hands. Then He took His relationships and He said, God, I'm going to put them in your hands as well. Keep them by the power of of your name. Friends, can I just say this? You can't keep your relationships together by yourself. You can't. You need to consecrate every relationship in your life. You need to consecrate it. You need to dedicate it. You need to take it and bring it back and put them in the hands of God. Because when you place your relationships in the hands of God, those relationships are kept safe. They are directed by the person and the power of God. And we don't have that ability. All of them need to be consecrated to the hands of God. And so Jesus says, Father, the disciples you gave me, the relationships you've given me, Father, I put these gifts right back into your hands, God. Keep them, Father. Now listen, he's on his way to Calvary. And in a, a chapter or two later, we see him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's there and he's saying, God, God, I'm committed to finishing this work. But if there's any other assignment, if there is any, any other way that I can complete this assignment, let me know. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So he places his will into the hands of God. And then he's on the cross and he finishes the ultimate assignment of dying in your place for, for your sins and mine. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
So he puts his gifts and talents into the hands of God. He takes his relationships and he puts them all in the hands of God. And he takes his own life, his whole life, and he puts it in God's hands. Because what Jesus realized is what we need to realize is that, he, that, that the only place, the, the only place of safety, the only place of fulfillment, the only place of strength, of peace, of joy, of love is in the hands of God. It's the only place we're going to find it. And so he places all that he has and all that he is in God's hands. And he does it because it all depends on whose hands it's in. So he takes his loved ones and, and he takes his gifts and, and he takes the places them all in God's hands. And, and then he takes his relationship, he places them all in God's hands. And then he takes his own life and he puts it all in God's hands. Because just as the Old Testament worship included us bringing our offering and putting it in the hands of the priest, today we bring our lives and we offer them up as a living sacrifice unto God. We put it all in God's hands. Because it all depends on whose hands it's in. See a guitar in my hand. It's a bunch of noise that you don't want to hear. But a guitar in the hands of Jason Sadison is beautiful music lifted up to the Lord. Because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A paintbrush in my hands will get more paint on my clothes than whatever it is I'm trying to paint. Trust me. But a paintbrush in the hands of Michelangelo will give you the beauty and the awe of the Sistine Chapel. One of the wonders of the world. Why? Because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A football in my hands. It's about $16.99. And a bunch of wobbly passes. Anybody? Anybody? But a football in the hands of Tom Brady is worth multi-million dollar contracts and seven Super Bowl wins, multiple MVPs, because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A basketball in my hands I checked it out, 20 bucks, and a bunch of bad dribbling. But a basketball in the hands of Michael Jordan is worth six NBA championships, six MVP awards, and a multi-billion dollar sneaker empire, because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A golf club in my hands. Is a dangerous weapon. <laughs> but a golf club in the hands of Tiger Woods means 18 world golf championships, 82 PGA Tour wins, and five Masters victories on top of everything else. Why? Because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A garment in my hands, just a piece of cloth, a piece of cotton, but in the hand of the woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem of the garment of Jesus, it was deliverance and healing for a sin-sick soul because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A cloak in my hands will keep me warm. But a cloak in the hands of Elisha meant a double portion of anointing for ministry because it all depends on whose hand it's in. A slingshot in my hands is a kid's toy. But a slingshot in the hand of David can bring down every Goliath of your life because it all depends on whose hand it's in. Two fish and five loaves of bread in my hands will get you a couple of fish sandwiches. But two fish and five loads of bread in the hands of Jesus will feed 5,000 men, a bunch of women, a bunch of kids, and have 12 baskets left over because it all depends on whose hand it's in. Spitting mud in my hands is gross. It might get you a mud pie. But spitting mud in the hands of Jesus will open the eyes of the man born blind because it all depends, friends, on who his hand is in. Nails in my hand.
hands will hand you a few pictures, but nails in the hands of Jesus has purchased your salvation, my salvation, and the salvation of the whole world, because it all depends on whose hand it's in. Oh, church, I'm telling you right now, it all depends on whose hand it's in. In the hands of Jesus, there's salvation. In his hands, there's deliverance. In his hand, there's healing, friends. There's freedom. There's security. There's peace. In his hands, there's joy. Oh, do you need joy? It's in his hands. It's there's power in his hands. In his hands, there's provision. In his hands, there's hope. Put everything in God's hands. Come on, stand with me. You need to put your relationship in his hands. You need to put your gifts in his hands. Your talents in his hands. Your problems. Your relationships. Your finances. Your assignment. Put your life in God's hands. Put your hand in the hand of the man who still the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the seas. Put your hand in the nail-scarred hands of the one who spoke everything into existence. And he will speak life over you as well. It depends on whose hand it's in. You keep it to yourself, you got what you got. You put it in his hands, it makes all the difference in the world. Because it all depends on whose hand it's in. What really matters, friends, is living a life that glorifies God. It's living a life of commitment, living a life that favorably and accurately represents the character of God. But it starts by putting yourself in His hands. Until that surrender happens, we have a tendency to do it all for ourselves. I can handle this. I can do this. I don't need you, Jesus. But by placing our hands, our lives, everything in his hands, we're saying, Jesus, without you, I can do nothing. I need you. And some of you need to do that for the very first time in your life. You've tried to run your life on your own. You've tried to be your own God. You got what you got. And you realize it's not life. You're just existing. And it's time for you to take everything that you are, all the blessings he's poured into your life, the very life that you have, and put it all in his hands. And some of you need to take the relationship that you're trying to make happen in your own strength, and you need to put it in God's hands and let him work through you and through him and through circumstances. And he'll take care of it. But you got to put it in his hands. Because it all depends on whose hand it's in.